time we'll be singing that song. I'd like to give thanks, first of all, to the Lord and to the men of the congregation who's given me a chance to speak to you. It's my hope and prayer that I can deliver a lesson that is first true to God's word and secondly, helpful to us as his children. And that is the topic that I've chose to speak on today. We've had a couple of lessons lately on spiritual growth, and this one's got kind of going to look a little bit different, but on the same train of thought, so to speak. If you would, turn to Matthew 18 and verse 3, and we read from the Bible with me. I'll share my understandings with you. If I misinterpret something or say something that's wrong or that you don't understand, please get with me after services, and I pray that we can study and come to a better understanding of it. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, we read, Unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That is the concept that I want to speak today about. When I read the passage, I think of Nicodemus, which we read about in John chapter 3. If you recall, Nicodemus was a grown man, which I believe was seeking the kingdom of God. He had trouble, though, understanding how to become a child of Christ. In John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, we read, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then we see where Nicodemus was confused. Nicodemus said to him, in verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Can he? Jesus answered him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Here in verse 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, Unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom. Like a lot of us, Nicodemus didn't understand them. So Jesus had to explain it more. He said, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. It's not a physical birth. It's a spiritual birth. So let's recall Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, where we were just a moment ago. We're told to become like children. I ask you, is that physically or spiritually? There are many traits that a child possess, which I believe are what Christ is referring to. This lesson will hopefully look at a few of them, which I feel that some or all of them we could look at, but a lot of these we lack as adults. So what are some of the traits that we as adults don't always possess? The first passage I would like to look at is in Matthew chapter 5. This passage is often what's referred to as the Beatitudes, or as I like to say, the attitudes that should be in us. The attitudes in this passage should be part of us, and we should strive to add each of these attitudes into our life. Jesus spoke these words, so we know they have to be true. But let us read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Beginning with verse 1, it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began teaching to them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's look at verse 4. Blessed is those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, you're probably going to say that children don't mourn. I would suggest to you that children can mourn as much as adults. True, sometimes adults may have more to mourn, but sometimes children still mourn more than we feel they should. If you don't believe me, ask my wife or any mother that has a child who has lost their favorite stuffed animal or toy. That child will sob, wail, cry, refuse to eat, sleep, or even breathe until that toy is found. Am I right, mothers? I know my granddaughter, if she doesn't have her famous favorite stuffed dog, she won't go to bed. Doesn't matter where it's at, it has to be found before she can go to bed. We as adults have the tendency to relate mourning with the loss of a loved one. But I suggest, as in Merriam-Webster Dictionary, that mourning is simply an act of being sorrowful. I believe we can be sorrowful for any loss, whether it's a person or an item that we much love. A loss of a beloved possession, I believe, can cause us to be to mourn and be sorrowful. But let's jump jump down to verse eight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It is true that you do not have to be a child to be pure in heart. But we should be pure in heart. Children are simply more likely to be pure in heart than adults are. As adults, many of us have been hardened by things that we suffer through in our lives, things that's happened to us in the past. It shapes who we are and how we react to things. Sometimes as Christians, we believe that life should be easy, that all we need is going to be given to us, but that's not exactly all that we were promised. We were told that we would suffer hardships and trials, but we will be provided a way to overcome. Children have have not been introduced to the hardships of life, hopefully, but nevertheless, they can have hardships that they go through. Continuing verse 9, we read, Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. I ask you, when children are together among themselves and a disagreement breaks out among children, isn't it wonderful when one of them just stops and says, let's not fight anymore? Perhaps one of them says those three little magic words that we as adults have trouble sometimes saying, I am sorry. This is a trait that we should never have is a failure to say, I am sorry. Too often, there are people who will hold a grudge that will stay hardened in their hearts simply because somebody upset them or did something to them. We should be childlike. We should say, okay, I'm sorry for what I did. Not what you did to me. I'm sorry for what I did to you in return. But so often we're not. Also, jumping back up to verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness or humility is something that Christ said is blessed. We should strive to be meek or humble, just as we strive to be all of these attitudes in in Matthew chapter 5. Going back to Matthew chapter 18, where we started a short while ago, let's read more of the passage, starting in verse 1. Chapter, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
And he called to himself and set before him children. And he said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it, it will be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Christ tells us in verse 6 that we need humility. We should strive to be meek. We should not think more highly of ourselves than other people. Many times we're no better than they are. Christ goes on to say that if someone harms a child or someone who is childlike, whom he just said that we should be like, that, that person who harms a child is better off dead. That's pretty harsh words coming from Christ, but again, if it's coming from Christ, we know it's truth. Christ says that if we receive or care for a child, we will be rewarded in heaven. We should receive children and others just like Christ says so that we can receive the care from Christ for ourselves. Mark's account of this also goes on to say that if one receives a like child, not only do we receive Christ, but we also receive his father. I can't think of better company that we could be in than with Christ and his father. I believe this also is a trait that we should strive to have. Often we talk about having childlike faith and being like a child, but we cannot stay as a child. Just as a child must grow up and mature, we too are to grow up, so to speak. We are told in Hebrews chapter 5, the Hebrew writers talking about to the Jews about the order of Melchizedek. And it says in verse 11 of Hebrews 5, Concerning him, we have much to say, it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant or a child. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice has their senses trained to discern from good and evil. We see that the Hebrew writer wanted to teach them a lesson that was more in depth, something that a little more difficult to understand, but he couldn't. They hadn't grown up enough. They haven't matured to the point where they could understand what he was trying to tell them. Here we clearly see that while we are told to have the attitude of faith like a child, we are also told that we must grow up and mature. And that's one thing that I think people struggle with sometimes. We're told, you know, believe and be baptized here in the Bible. We're told to repent and confess over here. The Bible's a collection. We can't pick out one part of the Bible and say, I'm going to obey this chapter, but I don't want to worry about over there. Or I didn't like the way Mark wrote his gospel, so I'm going to adhere to Matthew and not listen to Mark. We have to take the Bible as a collective works. But for a moment, let's think about a child who reaches school age and still be feeding, fed milk or soft foods. I've heard stories of one of my uncles coming home from kindergarten, I believe it was, or first grade maybe, and even getting a bottle of milk in a baby bottle when he comes home. That makes us kind of worry about that. We're worried about the development of that child. Spiritual development 
should be no different. A lot of times it is, but it should not be. In verse 13, we also read a moment ago that we are to start eating solid food. Again, I ask you, is it talking physically or spiritually? Are we growing spiritually in our faith? Or are we still children? Are we spiritually eating all that the word of God has to offer? Or are we just eating the milk of the word and not eating the meat of the word? I cringe when I hear people, other denominations, and some people of the the church of God, Christ, say, our congregation doesn't study revelations. It's too complicated. What? How can you say that part of the word of God is too complicated? What you're really telling me is, You're not grown up enough to understand that. Don't you desire to learn the whole word of God? Don't you want to eat meat? That would be like eating macaroni and cheese every day for the rest of your life. Sure, that'd be great. But it's not good for our physical health to ignore the other things that we eat. The meat, the potatoes. Those are things that have a purpose for our bodies to eat those foods. I'm often told I need to eat more salads, but it just ain't going to happen. But we, to use the analogy of judgment being a final exam, do you want to pass that final exam? Or are you going to tell the Lord God, I didn't read that chapter. It was too hard. I pray that none of us ever shy away from learning and growing in our faith. As I mentioned earlier in this lesson, we have a tendency to become fearful of things based on how our past has affected us. If we have suffered pain from riding a bicycle for the first time, sure, we're probably not real enthusiastic about getting up and getting back on it but we cannot fail to get back on that spiritual bicycle and continue on our spiritual journey. I'd like to close with Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. It says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kind of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven is great. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're not promised a rose garden. We're not promised that every choice we have to make in life is going to be as easy as saying, yes, I want to go to heaven. Sometimes we have to make tough choices and say, This shouldn't be in my life. I need to take this out of my life. Just like Brother Harold mentioned, the man that couldn't stop from cursing and asked for help from his friends. Sometimes we need our friends to help us out of trouble. We need to be like those children with all of the attitudes that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 5 so that we can be blessed. The only requirements or that we must come to Christ and obey his commandments and live faithfully unto death. I believe sometimes that's the hardest part. How often do we find that we fear we lack the faith to continue to fight, to continue to run the race that is set before us? If we believe the gospel and hear the gospel, to be, and we believe it to be the word of Christ, then Christ is the Son of God, and we truly repent of our sins and confess before men that Christ is the Son of God, we only have two more steps to accomplish to obtain a home in heaven. We must be baptized for the remissions of our sins and the removal of our sins, and then here's the biggest one, we got to remain faithful until death. That's perhaps the hardest part. For some of us, that step might span 40 years, maybe 60 years, 80 years possibly since we obey the gospel until we leave this world and achieve that crown. 
But until we reach the end of our race, we cannot stop running that race. It's a challenge. Nothing easy is ever considered a challenge. It's difficult, but we must. It doesn't mean that we won't, that when we run the race, we'll never get off track, that we never have to stop and take a breather, but we must get back on the track and finish the race to obtain the prize. If we do not finish, we do not obtain that prize that we want. We obtain a different prize, one that I'm sure we do not want. Again, this is spiritual. It's a race that all who finish will obtain eternity in heaven. Now I ask you that if you want to begin your race, or if you started the race, perhaps you stepped out of the race for a while, Perhaps you lost your way and are, are looking to come back to that race and finish. We pray that you will come forward now as we speak, that, as we sing, and get back on that way.